Having covered financial journalism, some of you may know me. We've chatted on the phone. I'm always interested in personal histories. And when I was doing interesting uh, background checks on Mr. Ross and Stephen, I found it interesting that, Wilbur, you actually had a different idea in terms of a career in mind. Uh, nothing related to finance. Can you tell me what you had in mind? Yeah, when I was a student at Yale, I really wanted to be a creative writer. And Yale saved me from that. They, <laughs> they had a course called Daily Themes which required you to put in 1,500 words every morning by 10 o'clock of either original prose or poetry. And after about two weeks, I found I was out of material. So uh, had I not made that discovery while well, still a student, I'd probably have had a life of poverty. So they were very good to me. If you were writing today, what would you be, uh, what kind of genre? Elmore Leonard uh, or uh, Stephen King? <laughs> well, all, all I write today are occasional birthday poems for friends. So. How about you, Stephen? Are you, I think you might have been a little closer to finance in your early career days. I, I took a slightly more direct route. I actually, uh, coming out of undergraduate, went into municipal finance. I uh, spent two years doing that and decided that was not necessarily my cup of tea in, uh, in between exiting my analyst program in, uh, and entering my MBA program, I actually joined up with Wilbur to do uh, corporate restructuring, have now moved on to focus on distress and, and ironically having started in municipal finance and, and 20 years later focused on distress, I've seemingly come uh, full circle. Back to uh, chapter nines. <laughs> uh, much today on the headlines of every newspaper is the word sequester, where it's, it's a mantra. Uh, I wonder what does it mean for the economy, economic growth, and at that same time, your portfolio companies, does it hurt them or does it provide distressed opportunity? I guess if you could start. Sure. Well, in terms of amount, I think you're well aware it's something on the order of 85 billion when it's fully implemented. And that might be six-tenths of a percent or thereabouts of GDP. But A, it will come in very gradually, probably take six months or so before it really comes in. And therefore, B, I don't think it will be on the six o'clock news every night uh, because it will be such a gradual thing. Probably will involve some temporary furloughing of some of the government employees, there will be some grandstanding, like the administration pulled, I think, five carriers back into uh, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, that's an attempt to grab headline. It doesn't really mean very much. Um, I think the effect of the original cliff would have been much more severe, because remember, it had these cuts, but it also had full potential for elimination of all of the Bush tax cuts, not just the ones that started at 400 or 450,000. So I think it, had it been the original cliff would have been more serious than this one. The uh, outcomes of it will be very localized. The District of Columbia, Virginia, and Maryland will be the hardest hit because they have a concentration of military bases and a large number of residences of government employees. So they'll probably feel it the most. But almost every state will feel something. There are, for example, military bases pretty much throughout the country. And so they'll all feel a little bit of uh, something. My own guess is that there may well be some relief granted to the military as the congressmen get complaints from their constituents there may be some reallocation of the cuts, but I don't think that the amount of the cuts is going to be changed, and I don't think that there will be a grand bargain, because the administration definition of a grand bargain seems to involve both more taxes and some less spending cuts. I can't imagine the Republican congressmen who are up for re-election next year wanting to have their fingerprints on yet another tax increase, it doesn't make any sense to me that they would, would want to do that. So I think the sequester will go into effect, and I don't think it's the end of the earth. I think that 
the housing boom that's come, and uh, shale gas and tight oil uh, could very easily more than overcome uh, the problems from sequester. I'll follow up from a, uh, a portfolio perspective and, and um, you know, look, as, uh, as Wilbur mentioned, I'd, I'd say as we look at our investments, we, we certainly were more concerned with the cliff than, than, than we are currently of the sequester. Um, we're in the middle of a, still what's a, a pretty fragile and anemic recovery, so, you know, no bad news and, and no hits are, are welcome, but we do think this is relatively small in scale, particularly against the uh, amount of, of headline news that it's creating. So while we monitor it very closely, we, we don't see a, a negative impact hitting our, our investments from it. You almost think that those bank officers that have uh, loans out in those states that are hit hardest would have to think about maybe extending some sort of uh, mortgage uh, relief to some borrowers. Well, it, it could be. Those areas were relatively unaffected by the uh, problems because of the stability of government employment. Unemployment is pretty low, especially uh, at the government and federal government level. Um, we don't have any banks right in that immediate region, so we don't have a problem there. Uh, we do have banks in quite a lot of other jurisdictions, but not particularly in the Virginia, Maryland, D.C. area. There's quite an echo coming. Is the techie can fix that? Do you think? You know, I think it's a little disturbing to people. Okay. What's uh, your outlook on shipping, energy, banking, and finance? Uh, when I look at the, the W.L. Ross uh, website, there's a preference for investments in industries that are out of favor with greater perceived risk than actual risk. So, given that uh, mantra. What, what do you think of those uh, areas? Well, in terms of banks, we, we had bought uh, Bank United down here in Florida from the F, uh, FDIC about three, four years ago, and that's worked out very well. We took it public about a year and a half ago. It was the largest uh, bank IPO uh, in the history of America. Went well. And we actually filed this morning for another secondary offering uh, by the uh, holders, but much smaller than our original one. So, and we're selling not because there's anything wrong with the bank. It's just been reporting very good earnings. It's just that if you're in private equity, the only reason you buy something is to sell it. And so we're gradually beginning that uh, process. Uh, we also have bank in New Jersey. Stephen's on the board of a very unique bank that I'll ask him to talk about called Amalgamated. Uh, we have Cascade in the Pacific Northwest, and we have Talmer out in the Midwestern part of the country. And then in Europe, we have Bank of Ireland, and we have uh, Virgin Money. So we've been gradually moving the focus of our bank investments away from the U.S. to Europe. Uh, Europe is where there's a lot more trouble right now in banking than there is here. And also, the European governments are frankly more hospitable to private equity investment than the present administration. So it's, it's a more convenient thing. But Stephen, why don't you talk about amalgamated? which I think is a pretty interesting history because it's a garment union workers it's, bank that it goes back 100 years? It goes back to uh, 1923. It's a uh, New York metro-based bank, roughly $4 billion in assets uh, originally and, and still currently uh, majority owned by the garment workers union. You know, as, as we look at our banking strategy, you can really bifurcate our, our banking portfolio into two parts, uh, the U.S. piece and, and the European piece, and we have a very distinct strategy when you, when you look at the two. You know, in the U.S., given the regulatory backdrop of, of what's going on within banking, we, we think you know, where we want to focus is, is really in the regional and super-regional space. And, and Amalgamated Bank, which is our uh, union-owned bank, uh, fits right into that. So it's in a very attractive market, very long history. You know, it's in that asset size where 
it really can, can compete both in the very back to basics community type banking, but also do some of the more sophisticated products like ABL lending, like sophisticated trust services, some of the more value added products. And, and, and that's where we think you can earn a, uh, a much better rate of return uh, in, in the US banking space. If you look at our European portfolio, we're in, in much bigger sized institutions than we are in the US. Well, now that we're on the subject of Europe, everybody has raised lots of money to put to work in Europe, and the constant complaint that I hear, or the consistent complaint is, the assets just are not for sale. Uh, the Europeans are not willing to give them up. Well, that's true, and uh, I think the reason for it is that, by and large, they haven't taken the markdowns that are needed. Nobody wants to sell uh, a distressed loan and take a big further hit as a result of doing so. So I've been pessimistic that there will be a big outpouring of credits from the European banks because I don't feel that the banking supervision and the regulation is sufficiently strict to require them to take the write down. So the only places you're really seeing paper come out are the banks that governments have taken over and or the bad banks, the NAMA in uh, Ireland, uh, this FROB probably will start doing that in Spain. Uh, and then you've had individual banks in the UK, Lloyds and RBS particularly, selling off some of their loan uh, portfolios. But it's been pretty small, very relatively little out of the German banks, relatively little out of the French and Italian banks. And I think until regulators get stricter, there, there won't be a big outpouring. Yeah, that, that's something Wilbur and I have spent quite a, quite a bit of time on looking at over the last couple of years is, you know, what is the opportunity in Europe going to be? Certainly a lot of people focused on it. And we've, we have felt from the beginning that the opportunity is probably going to be smaller than most expect and, and be more drawn out and protracted over a long period of time because it's a, uh, as Wilbur points out, not only do these banks not want to take the discount, most of them can't afford to take the discount. They don't have the capital base to do so. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I, I was actually in, uh, in Europe speaking with uh, a specific banking institution that we've been working with for, for quite a long period of tr time trying to, to get a deal together. And, and we were just lamenting a bit on why it's taken so long for us even to get to this point. And he had an interesting response. He said, look, in the U.S., when you have a $1 trillion banking problem, your government will throw $2 trillion at it to make sure it's fixed and it's fixed quickly. He said, here in Europe, when we have a 1 trillion euro banking problem, we'll throw 200, million, 200 billion euros at it, wring our hands for a little bit, then kick in maybe another 25, then another 10. But, you know, we hope that things will get better over time. And it, it just has really drawn out the process for, for both assets that are coming out of the banks themselves and, and really for the banks to uh, reform and, and get themselves stabilized. I would have thought that with all the expectations of the latest iteration of Basel that there would be greater uh, movement to uh, sell off some of those assets, but there's still sort of a stalemate there, I guess. I, I would separate the two. So, so, so I, we do think that there's going to be opportunity coming out of, of Basel III and, and some of the other uh, new regulations that are coming online, it, it, it's going to be less of the traditional uh, non-performing assets that you see. Wh where we see a role for private equity really coming in and, and, and working with banks is, is coming on to, you know, take, take on risk assets that traditionally banks have been involved with but have been de-emphasizing given new regulatory constraints that are put on them. So, uh, for example, uh, we think of shipping financing, aircraft financing, rail car financing, you know, in that category. If you look at uh, the U.S. market, uh, places like mortgage servicing is an area that the banks clearly are uh, seeking to exit because of the capital hit. So we do see opportunities coming out of uh, the new reg regulatory uh, framework within banks, but, but it's, it's, it's different than the general uh, plain vanilla non-performing assets that, uh, that, that, that many are focused on. So the current investment themes at WL Ross focus on financial services, healthcare, heavy materials, energy, and transportation. 
three of those are heavily regulated. It's got to be uh, shifting sands every day, for example, the GSEs, how the GSEs interact with the lenders, has to impact not only how you underwrite loans, how you service loans, how you securitize them, and then your investment vehicles that hold the bonds backed by home loans, how do you determine value if you don't know how they're going to refi and prepay? With all that, what, what, what do you, how do you manage that regulatory risk? Well, we did our first mortgage servicer back some seven years ago. Uh, we bought American Home Mortgage out of uh, bankruptcy. Then we added parts of Option 1, parts of Ameriquist, part of Home Savings. Ended up with a quite large company called Homeward Residential, which we sold to Aquin uh, just before the end of last year, mostly for cash. But we did take back about $160 million of a convertible preferred in uh, Auckland. So we've lightened up some in that sector, but we're not out of it altogether by long shot. That, that's the single family side. In the residential multifamily side, uh, we bought from Deutsche Bank uh, what now is called Berkeley Point, very large originator and servicer uh, of uh, mortgages on apartment houses, mostly sold to the GSEs. And you might have noticed yesterday, the uh, director of the FHFA announced that uh, uh, this, uh, it's kind of a reorganization of Fannie and Freddie. Namely, they're going to combine their back offices into a new entity. To, to me, it's probably a, a long overdue consolidation but it's only in Washington that the way you would make an economic thing is to create another bureaucracy. <laughs> it's really kind of an odd way to go about it. Um, I would have thought you'd just merge the two back offices into one of them and, and let it go with that, but they did not. They're going to create a new creature with a whole new board and a whole new uh, chief executive. The more substantive thing that DeMarco announced was they're going to cut back uh, something like 30% in their single family side and something like 10% in the multifamily side. And apparently the way they're going to do it is by raising fees and having a little bit more strict uh, credit standards than before. The idea being eventually to close the disparity, the kind of arbitrage between government mortgages and uh, private sector mortgages with the idea of private sector getting back in. That's probably a healthy development. How exactly it will be implemented is a little bit unclear, but I do think that in general, they've been underpricing uh, their product. They're still making loans as high as 96.5% loan to value, and to me, if you lend 96.5%, you're underwater the day you make the loan. Because if you had to resell it and pay something like a 6% brokerage commission, plus it'll be vacant for a while, so there'll be property taxes and insurance and stuff. So it never, to me, it never made any sense that somebody would make an asset-based loan uh, knowing they were immediately underwater uh, on the assets. So I think it's high time that they do that. I think it's better too from a societal point of view. I don't think you do anybody a favor cramming them into a house they really can't afford because that's what leads to a lot of foreclosures. And there's few things more traumatic to a family than getting kicked out of their house. So I, I think it's better from both economic point of view and societal. We actually think it will be, these changes in policy will be a benefit to the institutions we're in because they would be better off making slightly higher rate private sector mortgages than uh, the cheaper Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac things. So I, I think it will help us in, in that sense. Um, but it, it will be a change in market share the uh, Fannie and Freddie and FHA are now something like 86%, if memory serves, of the new mortgages single family granted. 
and uh, the GSEs are also 60 some odd percent of the multifamily mortgages granted. So it's a good idea to shrink that down. On the subject of housing, what's your take on housing? Has it come back? Is that a true return to health? Yeah, I think it's stabilizing. You know, when you talk about housing or anything in real estate, you really have to talk region by region because it's a peculiarly local activity. But Miami, for example, is booming. And the regions that are booming, not surprisingly, are the ones like Miami where you have inbound migration. In the case of Miami, 20% of all the condos sold last year were sold to Brazilians, just to one group. And that's a lot. But there are also all kinds of other South Americans and uh, North Americans going into Miami. It's become a quite amazing city. Um, in contrast, you have places like Las Vegas not having a big inbound migration. P things are struggling uh, there. So it's a little tricky place by place, but in general, we think the worst of it is over, and in a lot of markets, housing is up maybe five to eight percent, something like that. Stephen, we were uh, talking before about the interesting turnaround in servicing. Uh, if you looked at banks and mortgage industry in the late 90s, as late as 2005, servicing was thought to be this golden part of the bank portfolio. Now, because of regulatory issues, people are selling off their servicing businesses. And does this create an opportunity for folks like yourself? We think it has, and, and we think it, uh, it still continues to. As, as Wilbur mentioned, we had uh, created, starting in, uh, in 2005, one of the larger independent uh, servicing platforms uh, originally called American Home Mortgage, uh, uh, renamed to Homeward, which recently was sold to, to Aquin. We continue to hold a number of, of smaller platforms that deal both in single family and multifamily servicing. And we're starting to see opportunities over in Europe as well, which is several years behind in its life cycle and in its restructuring of the banking sector. And, uh, and we think there's going to be opportunity over there as well to set up servicing platforms and, and make a, uh, a, an attractive private equity rate of return. So when you sold Homeward uh, Residential Holdings last fall, you said we're not running away from the mortgage space at the right. time. Where else do you see an opportunity? Not just in real estate or mortgages, but uh, for example, shipping. Yeah. There are a lot of distress there. Yeah, you know, we've, we've gotten very involved in shipping for a couple of reasons. One, uh, shipping is fundamental to world trade. 80 plus percent of all trade in the whole world is, is carried on ships. And it's logical because whatever else may be the outcome, clearly you're having rising standards of living in the emerging countries. And when you're talking populations with per capita income $1,000 a year, rising standard of living mainly means rising consumption of commodity. So we think there will be a long-term secular growth superimposed on the normal cyclicality of commodities. So that's one reason. Second reason is that in order to pay for those things that they're importing, we're going to have to re-export finished goods, so you're going to have two-way kinds of shipping. But what happened to shipping, the last boom was around 2006, 2007. Charter rates went to the sky, and as a result of that, the banks and equity investors threw capital at the industry. There was a grotesque over-ordering of vessels and lo and behold, those vessels are now hitting the sea in the midst of a very tepid economic environment. So you have overcapacity. Utilization has gone down, and rates in most segments are down 80% from their high, and often don't even cover the direct cost of the voyage. So it's, it's pretty severe. But we like industries that are fundamental industries, and we think this is. So if you can get a proper entry point, and if you have a capital structure that'll let you live through a protracted bad period, we think you can come out uh, all right. So we have two main investments in it. 
One is a company called Diamond S, which is in both the crude tanker Suez Max size, size vessels and is also uh, in the petroleum products segment uh, with so-called MR medium range and LR long range uh, product tankers. Th those are both plays on the changing map of where oil is found and where oil is refined. Obviously, the shale oil in the U.S. is changing the map quite a bit. Now, under U.S. law, by and large, you cannot export crude, but you are permitted to export petroleum uh, products. In fact, there was a big series of ads in today's Wall Street Journal that you might have seen talking about the very topic. So w we think the U.S. Uh, is going to greatly reduce its reliance on imported crude, probably by 4 million barrels a day, going from 2011 to 2014. And if that really happens, you'll have a more than a 1% increase in GDP simply because of domestic production versus imports, and it would reduce our balance of trade deficit by about 25%. So these are big, powerful things. Meanwhile, what's happening is it's very hard in the States and in Europe to get the permits to build a new refinery or even to keep modifying an existing one. So where refineries are tending to be built is in China and Vietnam and India and places like that. So what that means is crude will get hauled out there. Some will be consumed with domestically needed uh, petroleum products, but a lot of the petroleum products will be re-exported. So it's creating a lot more ton miles of uh, oil and oil product cargoes. The other one we're in is a company called Navigator, a large portion of which we bought from the uh, bankrupt estate of Lehman Brothers, which some of the people in this room, I think, were involved in. And they're in a different segment. They're in LPG, in fairly small vessels called Handymax size, 22,000 deadweight tons. And these carry LPG and uh, other natural gas output to the very shallow harbors in many of the developing markets. So it's an, a niche business there. And it's been kind of a roll up. When we started into Navigator, they had eight of the 81 vessels of their type uh, afloat. Uh, with some new build orders and some acquisitions, we now have a one third market share uh, of that whole industry. And we think that will give us a competitive advantage because if somebody needs a vessel, they need it on a particular date in a particular location. So if you have the most vessels, you're probably going to get the first call because you'll be more likely to have a ship of the type they need in the location they need when they need it. So we're, we're quite excited about the two shipping ventures and we intend to do more in shipping. We don't think shipping turns around until at least 2014. It's interesting. Uh, how do your charter rates get impacted by the fact that many in many of the shipbuilding companies in China still keep putting down keels? And yeah. uh, that's part of the social compact there. So how do you deal with that? Well, it is indeed. Ch China to us is really about jobs. It's not about anything but jobs. And shipbuilding uses quite a lot of jobs and relatively good paying jobs. So we have been avoiding the container segment and the dry bulk segment, the steel and um, other bulk materials like grain, because those are relatively easy vessels to build. Chinese have very good experience with them. And we think there's a great danger that they'll use their financial strength to keep force feeding uh, vessels in those segments, even though they may not be needed. Because ship owners are a little like real estate people. If you give them the money, they'll build it. 
And I couldn't so, help but think that uh, there's a parallel there, the overbuilding, the charter rates going up, and the ex expectation that you'll always get those orders coming right. in, and you'll be able to put that boat to work at right. X amount of money. Yeah, it, it, it is very similar to, to the real estate side uh, in that regard. It's, it has one little advantage over it in that at least a boat you can move. So if there's demand in some geography but not another one, you're not trapped. Or you Whereas, could cut it up and sell scrap. Or yeah, is that that, that, that's hardly a good way to make a profit, though. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get about $400 a ton for scrap, and okay. it costs a lot more for a new vessel. Uh, Stephen, you work with the auto side of the portfolio. I was wondering if you'd tell me what you're seeing in that space. Uh, we hear that all the auto giants are faring better, but when I look at European auto firms, they're not doing as well. Some need a little government help. Um, what are you looking at when you look at the auto space? Sure. I, I, I think it's, uh, as you hit it, it's, it's two very different markets uh, here and, and, and over in Europe. And, and it really dates back to um, the initial crisis that we had and, and, and the difference in how the, uh, the two geographies <coughs> dealt with the crisis. You know, here, um, you know, while we did have, you know, the Cash for Conquerors program to, uh, you know, to, to help boo the industry a bit, um, we also forced the companies, you know, including, you know, the two, two of the three domestic OEMs, um, to, to force a large restructuring program, forced a lot of suppliers to go under, and much of that capacity has stayed out of the system, and, and therefore we've got a much more fundamentally sound business here in, in Europe. Um, much of the capacity was uh, continued to stay afloat, and, and really you ended up with a, a bit of a zombie industry from a supply base perspective. So now that they've reached another dip in the market, you're really starting to see that impact um, the, the broader industry. And, and as I look at uh, sort of value investing and distressed investing, you know, we do see opportunities forming in Europe, particularly guys who you know, have more capacity than they need, particularly guys who were not willing or able to globalize their, uh, their, their footprints and their platforms, they're going to struggle. And, 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 and we would argue that if you are a, a European sort of regional automotive supplier, you probably have a, a relatively short shelf life ahead of you, um, both in terms of uh, broader industry uh, dynamics and, and, and where the shift in the industry is headed, as well as just the near-term volume issues that, uh, that they're clearly facing. So for, uh, for distressed investing, certainly see um, some interesting opportunities starting to bubble up. So when it comes to distressed investing, we've not had that many billion dollar filings. In fact, I think this year to date, the only billion dollar filing we have is Reader's Digest. Right. Uh, but there are some interesting items out for sale. Uh, Hostess was out there. Uh, did you look at Hostess? Did you look at Reader's Digest? No, Would we you didn't. Even we, bother? No, we, we, we didn't look at either of those. We did look at Heart Marks, uh, which is another brand kind of a thing. But uh, management there decided to do its own bootstrap plan, so uh, we, we didn't participate in it. Uh, the Hostess thing, frankly, didn't appeal to us too much. I think white bread uh, is a 19th century concept, not a 21st century concept. And while, while Twinkies <laughs> may capture people's imagination, I, I, I just, it's not for us. Right. Any, any other uh, bankruptcy sales that were of interest in the last year, uh, for example? Well, there, you... there, there were a lot. As I say, we bought some stuff from the Lehman yeah. bankruptcy. We bought some from others. And, but mostly what we'd been focusing on, uh, particularly in Europe, has been buying banks from the government. Uh, we bought uh, Bank of Ireland, reprivatized it, and uh, we helped Virgin Money buy Northern Rock uh, from the UK government. That was the first of the big savings banks in the UK that failed uh, during this uh, crisis. Uh, and both have been working out pretty well uh, for us. We think Northern Europe is quite different from the Club Med uh, countries in that you don't have the big need for structural reform of the economies and the societies in Northern Europe that you have in Southern. So while they all have the sovereign debt problem, they all have the budget balancing problem, 
at least the northern countries don't have these other uh, issues uh, that we think could take a very long time to solve. When people for generations have been making tax evasion an Olympic sport, it's, it's going to be very hard to get them to mend their ways. So to close, uh, I, I always wonder what, how people look at investments. And I sort of draw a parallel to fishing. Somebody looks at a water and they don't see anything. And I see, uh, oh, maybe there's a current there and throw in a particular lure. My father says, no, do something else. So I have to ask, what, when you go fishing for an investment, what are you looking at? And when you go fishing for an investment, what are you looking at? And how are they different? And that collaborative spirit, how mm -hmm. does that come about at, when you find something, whether it's in a court sale or right. in Europe? Well, uh, the analogy to fishing is good in another regard in that we are talking about things that are underwater. <laughs> so, so in that sense, it's, it's a very apt uh, analogy. We really don't go looking initially for individual fish. What we try to figure out is where will the fish be next week, next month, next year, and try to get ready in advance. Uh, shipping we looked at and studied for almost two years before we made a commitment. Um, and that's not at all unusual uh, for us because we're trying to find things where there is, as you mentioned, a gap between perceived risk and actual risk. Our, our theory is you may get paid for taking perceived risk, but there's certainly no guarantee that you get paid for taking actual risk. We think the guy who came around with the slogan that risk and reward were somehow proportionate must have been an investment banker with a very risky deal. Because when you think about it, for there to be any kind of proportionality, there'd have to be some deity up there in the sky that would say, Wilbur, you took a big risk on this thing, therefore you deserve a big reward. I don't think that deity exists. So we try to avoid actual risk and instead take perceived risk. So that's where the fishing thing is different. You want a real fish, not a, a make-believe fish. Right. I, I'd say in similar fashion, I, I'd say what we look for in, in using the fishing analogy is we try to see where all the other fishing boats are setting off to and, and go in the other direction. Um, yeah, we, we, we tend to focus on out-of-favor industries. Uh, if you look at our portfolio, it is, is overwhelmingly uh, populated through proprietary investments. Um, because we think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of a tough business to, to go into auctions and really compete on you know, who's going to put the biggest number on a piece of paper and, and, and email it in. So um, you know, I, I'd say we, we try to find sort of differentiated waters that we can get into and, and still get, the, uh, uh, you know, get what we want at the end of the day. On the idea of differentiated waters, one last investment theme, middle market lending. There seems to be a fair amount of it in the U.S., but not much of it in Europe. Are you doing anything in that area? We are, we, we're spending quite a bit of, of time in Europe uh, at, at uh, this moment, and we do think middle market uh, is an area that, that's going to be one of, of pretty good opportunity. If you look at uh, you know, how companies in Europe get financing, it's, it's primarily through the banks, and the banking system is in uh, such, such poor shape that we are seeing opportunities where you have you know, businesses that, that are, are not necessarily distressed themselves, but do have liquidity problems because their access to capital, their ability to fund working capital or growth capital has disappeared on them. And, and again, I think that's uh, an area where uh, private equity funds like ourselves can sort of step in, um, be the, I would call it rescue financing or bridge financing to other sources of liquidity to these businesses. And, uh, and, and earn a, uh, a nice return. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you for thank your time. You and good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you very much.